It is a joy and an honor and a privilege to be with you this morning. And I thank you for the opportunity. And I'm grateful that Pastor Frank is at Pleasant Chapel this morning. I know that they will be blessed. I'm so grateful to have some of my friends and my family here with me today. And it's good to meet some of you today for the first time. Others of you I have known for the past decade or two or three. <laughs> as our paths have crossed at camp, at Manchester, at conferences, at retreats like Brethren Way of Christ and Faith Quest, and at Timbercrest. I guess you could say that when the brethren are gathered together to celebrate, I want to be there. But that has not always been the case. Some people, including my husband of nearly 17 years, find it hard to believe that there was a time in my life when I was painfully shy. When I was growing up, I detested going to school. And I didn't want to go to a church filled with people who might want to talk to me. And I certainly didn't want to go to Sunday school where, where people might ask me questions that I didn't know the answers to. My mom took my two older sisters and me to church, different churches, some when we were growing up. And I do have good memories from those times. But our home life was unstable. And my two older sisters and I moved in with our aunt and uncle when I was 10. They didn't attend church, and I personally was happy to have one day a week when I didn't have to deal with people. My sister Laura's friend Sherry invited Laura to go with her to the Anderson Church of the Brethren, and Laura found a wonderful church family there, and she got involved. She attended there for a couple of years before she went to Manchester College. I went with her a few times. I even went with the youth group to regional youth conference, known then as RYC, known today as Powerhouse. Laura was on the planning committee her first year of college and my first year of high school. And I did enjoy RYC. I liked spending time with the youth of the church, but I still was not an active member there. But everything changed on May 25th 1987, two days before I turned 16. Laura was home from school, and she and her friend Sherry were going to go shopping. They invited me to go along with them. And after we were done and about to head home, I noticed that Sherry put her seatbelt on. Now, wearing the seatbelt back then wasn't law, but Sherry was pregnant, so she was being extra cautious. And because she put her seatbelt on, Laura put her seatbelt on. And I sat in the back and I wondered, why are they doing that? Nobody's ever really in a car accident. I found out differently that day. I'd fallen asleep in the back seat and I heard a scream. I looked up and I saw a van pulling out in front of us. It felt like a dream, so I just closed my eyes and went back to sleep. I really like to sleep. <laughs> the next thing I knew, Laura was pulling me out of the windshield and onto her lap. As I sat there talking with Laura and Sherry, I thought, it is time for me to get serious about my relationship with Jesus. I ended up getting over 50 stitches in my face and left me with some scars. But I'm grateful for those scars because they are daily reminders to me that life on this earth is temporary and I want to get the most out of it. And even then, never having been overly active with any one church family, I knew in my heart that getting the most out of life meant having a relationship with Jesus and living for him. I went to church the next Sunday, and I've never stopped. It may be true to say that all of us have been hurt by people in the church at some point, or if we haven't yet, we likely will be. And maybe we've hurt brothers and sisters, maybe intentionally, maybe unintentionally. The church is made up of flawed human beings, but the joy and the peace and the relationships and the comfort and the responsibility 
of being a part of the body of Christ is truly incredible and fulfilling and joyful and a privilege and a gift. And all of us who've called out to Jesus as our Savior now make up the body of Christ. And the Lord has given us a spiritual gift, or two, or three, or more. And we are responsible to use the spiritual gifts that God has given to us. You can read about some of the spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. I think in our human nature, it's easy to compare ourselves to other people and feel like we don't measure up. We might think, well, I can't do things as well as he does them, so why should I even bother to try? Well, I can't do that the way that she does it, so why should I bother? But in the body of Christ, all of us, all of us are important, and each part is necessary. In fact, 1 Corinthians 12.22 says, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. Now, I certainly could think, who am I to be speaking at Union Center Church of the Brethren? Now, that Pastor Frank, he's a brilliant man. He writes for Messenger Magazine and other Church of the Brethren publications on a regular basis. He can write and act in plays. He can write up a daily summary for the journal and have it published and sent out to all the annual conference goers every day during conference. And that man, well, he can rock a bow tie. <laughs> or I could think there are a lot of people at Union Center who are highly educated academics. I'm not going to share anything with them that they haven't heard before, so why should I bother? Or I could read through Manchester Magazine and see what some of my peers are doing today. And some of them have very impressive careers like teachers and professors, doctors and surgeons, politicians. Well, some may seem like more impressive careers than others. But really, being a part of the body of Christ isn't about comparing ourselves to each other in that way. It is about loving God. It is about loving each other and being faithful to use the spiritual gifts that God has given to us to help the church and to spread the love of God in this world. A lot of people at Manchester University have helped to mold and shape many of us. A lot of brilliant people work there. For many of us who have been a student there in the past 30 years, there is a name that brings a smile to many of our faces, and that name is Patty Cox, also known as Patty the Lunch Lady. Patty retired a couple of years ago, but for those who were involved with Manchester any time between 1990 and 2017, we remember Patty and the love and the encouragement that she gave to us every day. Has God called you to be an administrator? Be the best administrator you can be. Has God called you to be a teacher? Be the best teacher that you can be. Has God called you to encourage? Be the best encourager you can be. And we could say these simple words every morning, Jesus, I love you. Here I am. Send me, guide me, direct me. Direct my thoughts, my words, my steps. Be glorified in whatever it is you call me to do. I offer my life a living sacrifice. And then be obedient. I heard a story about a group of German students who, after World War II, volunteered to rebuild a cathedral that had been bombed by the Germans. As work progressed, they became concerned about a, la a large statue of Jesus that they found in the church with outstretched arms. And beneath the inscription was the inscription, Come unto me. The problem with the statue is that the hands had been completely broken off and destroyed. After they discussed what to do, they decided that they would leave the hands off the statue and change the inscription to, Christ has no hands but our hands. As a reminder that Jesus is in heaven, that the body of Christ is here on earth, and the only Christ that many people will ever see is the Christ that they see in his body, in his believers. We are his body. 
Romans 12, 4 and 5. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body. And each member belongs to all of the others. In his message, Fully Engaged with My Church, Dr. David Jeremiah shared the following. We must remember that the church is not an organization. The church is an organism. It is a living, breathing organism, like the human body. And the human body is given to us as an example of the church. How does the human body illustrate the church? The human body is made up of many parts, many members, and the human body cares for itself. Someone wrote, a healthy body cleans itself, scratches itself, exercises itself, shaves itself, brushes its hair, feeds and waters itself, etc. But more specifically, the members of the body serve other members of the body, and every member of the body is involved in some capacity. No member is unimportant. Each one has a function, and as 1 Corinthians 12 talks about, what would the body be if it was all just an eye or all just an ear? All of us bring something unique to the body of Christ. Romans 12, 4, for we have many members. That's talking about the church, the body of Christ, over, all over the world. And there are so many who need to be ministered in the body of Christ that it's important for all of the members to share in the ministry. Every time a person in the body says, it's not my responsibility, when really it is, someone else in the body is saying, why isn't ministry touching me? Because everybody in the body has been gifted by God to make a difference. And when we don't minister, when we don't use the gifts that God has given to us, it may bring us some relief. But someone over here who God intended to receive ministry, that God intended for you to do, that person is being left out of the process. Romans 12, 4 says we are many members in one body. And all of the members do not have the same function. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6 and 11 puts it this way. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them, and everyone is the same God at work. All these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one, just as he is determined. God has given us the privilege to be part of the church, the most diverse organism in the history of the world. And the Bible says that while we're all different, we share one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And we all have a gifting, and we all have purpose. Romans 12:5. In Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all of the others. There's diversity and unity. One, but many. Diverse, but in a sense, the same. And when you look out and you see people of all ages, all ethnic backgrounds, we realize what a privilege it is to be part of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, Paul wrote, Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. In a world that's trying to figure out how to deal with racial issues, the body of Christ is the answer. In Christ, racial differences no longer matter because we are one in the body. And that is a wonderful treasure that we have in the church. And the gift that you have is so important. You bring something unique to the church. And this gives me the freedom to ask you, are you using your gift? You might think, well, I'm not worthy. Or I don't have an education. 
or I have a rough background. Here are some people in the Bible who were gifted, and I want you to think about who they were, what they did, and how God used them. I shared this at the mother-daughter tea, and I think it's worth repeating. And this is meant to free us all up 100% to serve the Lord and his body, the church, in the ways that he has gifted us to do so. Moses had a stuttering problem. Gideon was afraid. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. David had an affair and had a man murdered. Elijah was suicidal. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist ate bugs. Peter denied Christ. The disciples fell asleep while they were praying. Martha worried about everything. Mary Magdalene was immoral. The Samaritan woman was divorced more than once. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was too religious. Timothy had stomach problems. And Lazarus was dead. God is not waiting for perfect people. God is waiting for willing people. God calls us and God equips us. And God will not call you to do something that he will not enable you to do. The people I listed maybe thought they couldn't or shouldn't be used by God. But there's some of the people that God used to the greatest extent because they were willing to be available. You might just say a simple prayer. Lord, I'm available to be your servant in whatever you ask me to do. I close with Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not forsaking the assembly, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Amen.